Good morning. I have to get used to this table up here. Uh, my name is Michael Duenas. I, I know many of you uh, know me, but I don't know that everyone does. Uh, we're fairly new to the church, I guess. We've been here about a year. My wife, Jenny, and my four children uh, sitting back there. Um, we Just a little bit of background on how we got here. I'm originally from California and uh, grew up there, and uh, my wife and I were married there, and we lived in the Bay Area for a while, and then we uh, decided that it was ridiculous, uh, the expenses to live there, and we were having more children, and um, so we thought Kansas. Uh, <laughs> now, that wasn't our first thought, but that uh, my wife does have some uh, family in Olathe, and we've been kind of near my family there in Southern California, and so we thought we would be uh, try to live somewhere near uh, my wife's family or some of her family, and I was going to be going to law school. I, I had been a Bible teacher at a Christian school in the Bay Area for 10 years, and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, but as I said, we were having more children, and uh, I, I knew what my, my salary was going to be at the end of about 30 years, and that wasn't going to work even for where we were after 10 years. And so anyway, we had to make some choices, and I decided to become a lawyer so you might want to listen carefully to what I'm saying up here, uh, just in case I try to slip something past you. But uh, no, we, we, and we didn't know about, the reason we know about this church, um, we, we knew the Tappans from Trail Life, but also I had, uh, while I was in law school, I'd taken a clerkship at the Kansas Corporation Commission, and Sam Feather was already working there. And so Sam and I had occasion to work on some projects together, didn't know who Sam was, uh, um, but Sam came into my little area there. I had a cubby there, and one of my children, uh, our children are homeschooled, but one of my children, he had, it was like a Phoenician boat, you know, those boats where you've got like the 12 guys on each side, you know, and so he would colored that in and said, oh, daddy, daddy, take this to work. You put this up in your office. I had a number of things up in there, you know, Ford F-150 trucks, uh, stuff like that. And so that was up on my office wall, and uh, Sam comes in being, a, you know, perceptive and intuitive like he is, and says, uh, you guys homeschool, right? And I said, well, how do you know that? He goes, well, you got a Phoenician boat there on your wall. I mean, most, most kids who aren't homeschooled aren't drawing Phoenician boats, and, you know, so that was the beginning of our friendship, and... Uh, I owe most things what I'm doing now in Topeka to Sam. So uh, we're sort of here because of him. And we worked together for, what, a couple years, I think, um, at the Corporation Commission. So um, that's a little bit of background on, on how I got here. But uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I don't know how long this is going to be, uh, so I won't make any cracks about being shorter or longer than Casey because I really don't know how that's going to work out. But... What I do want to talk about is, I think, in line with what Casey has been talking about, what, what we've been talking about here as a church in terms of living the e eternal life in God's kingdom now. That when we put our trust in Christ and uh, through his death and resurrection, that eternal life begins at that point. It's not something that starts when we die it's not, we, we don't just sort of pass over the spiritual barcode and now we're in and then we just wait to, you know, go to heaven. That there's a, a life that Jesus offers us through his death and resurrection and his ascension to God's right hand where, from where he's ruling and reigning. And that life through his spirit is what he offers to us now. And that what we, that's the eternal kind of life. And he means to make us different kind of people than we were before we knew him. That's what the gospel is about. It's not just about sort of cleaning up the old person. It's about becoming an entirely new person. Like Paul says, the old has passed away. All things are new. And so that's what we've been talking about and trying to, to live out and trying to do. But the, the basis for all that, and something that I think is, has been important for me uh, throughout my Christian life, is the foundational role that the Word of God plays in that. Uh, without the Word of God, there is no spiritual life. And so it made me think about the, the scripture in Deuteronomy, which is the scripture, the text that's on your, your bulletin there is the title for this sermon. Um, and so I'm going to read that, and then we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll get into it. This is Deuteronomy chapter 32, and I'll start in verse 45. And um, 
just to kind of set this up, Moses has been with the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. They're right on the cusp of entering the promised land. They're there on the other side of the Jordan. Moses knows he's not going in. God has already said, you're not going in with them. My servant Joshua will lead them across. Uh, but Moses has shepherded these people and been through all of the travails and the grumbling and the murmuring and all the, all the way to this point. And he, he gives them, he reads the law, he gives them this final song. And then in verse 45, it says, And when Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. For it is no trifle for you, but it is your life. And thereby you shall live long in the land which you are going over the Jordan to possess. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have your word that has been given to us. We are quite aware that there are many peoples on this earth today who have never heard your word. They don't know it. It's never reached them. They may not even know it exists. We pray for them that your word would go forth and that it might reach them. We pray for all of us here today as we listen to your word that it would move and break through to us in new ways, Lord, as the psalmist says that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your law, that we would see and savor you and that we would be encouraged, Lord. There's probably not much new that I'm going to say here, but I pray that what I say would be from you and that you would impress it upon us for our good and your glory. Amen. So Moses says that this law is no trifle for you, but it is your very life. This is what Moses wants them to know. He said, I'm, I'm about to die, so my parting word to you is that this word is one that you need to be familiar with. He's already, he already told them in Deuteronomy 6, this is the word that you should teach your children diligently. You should talk about it when you're at home and when you're on the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You should put it on the doorposts of your gates and on your house. You should put it on your forehead and on the palms of your hands, everywhere you can think of, so that you're thinking about it and talking about it constantly, because the Bible is no trifle. It's no empty word. It's our very life. Now, what I want to do is I want to try to put this in the context, again, of what we've been talking about and I know uh, probably everyone here is familiar with Dallas Willard. We, you've probably read some of his books in your small group. Um, and, and a lot, he has a, a large, his teaching has a large influence here. And I want to do that too. I want to put God's word in the context of something I think that's helpful in terms of engaging the gospel and growing in our spiritual lives. And the acronym is VIM, V-I-M. And it stands for Vision, Intention, and Means vision, intention, and means. And so when we think about this, th this is how we can engage with the gospel to grow. We have to have a vision of God's kingdom, what it is that God offers us. Then we have to think about our intention. Is our intention to become, with God's help and by his grace, the kind of people that he wants us to be? And then we have to employ means to become that kind of person. We have a role to play. It doesn't just happen to us passively. As we have the vision and we intend to follow Jesus in his way, then we employ the means that he gives us. So I want to say a little bit about the vision, I think, for God's word. And again, none of this will be new. I just want to kind of put this out by way of reminder. Uh, but I think a New Testament parallel to Moses' word that, that the law is no trifle would be Jesus' statement to the devil when the devil asked him to turn the stones to bread, he said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We live on it. It's food for us. Um, and Jesus said, I don't need physical food at this point. I live upon the words that come from God. 
The word of God is powerful. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. It says, let the prophet, God is speaking, and God has, Jeremiah is living in a terrible time in Israel. Okay, the people are going into exile. They've been disobedient for decades. Uh, and Jeremiah, God is indicting the prophets, the leaders, saying, you have led my people astray. You have spoken false words to them. God says, let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. Or this is Jeremiah speaking through the prophet. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? So God's word is not just some information. It has power. It's like fire. Jeremiah says, it's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish the purpose which I desire and prosper everywhere I send it. When God's word goes forth, it prospers. It breaks through. It has an effect. It's effectual. It's powerful. It's eternal. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Psalm 119, verse 89, your word is forever, Lord. It is firmly established in heaven. Okay, so it's a powerful word. It's an effective word. It's a eternal word. Okay, this is the vision of what you know, God has given us. It's living and active. Hebrews 4.12, I'm sure you, you all know this scripture. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even to the dividing of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, judging the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. John 6, 63. Jesus is speaking to the Jews and his disciples. He said, the spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Again, it echoes Moses. Moses says, the word's not a trifle for you. It's your very life. Jesus says, these words I'm speaking to you, they are spirit. They are life. They have power. I'll leave it for you to think about what it means that words can be spirit. I've thought about that one for a while. I don't know the answer, but, but we know that they, are, they have spiritual power. They have life-giving power. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. So that everything you see around you is made, came into existence by the word of God. In fact, Colossians says that he upholds all things. Hebrews 1 says the same. He was, the universe was created through him. He upholds all things by his powerful word. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10. This is probably familiar to almost all of you as well. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That means our souls need reviving. And the word of God revives them. It's perfect. It revives the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. If you're simple, if you're ignorant which we all are. The statutes of the Lord make us wise. They give us wisdom. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and righteous altogether. They are more, he says, they're more to be desired than gold than pure gold. All of us would probably like to have pure gold. I'd like to have some pure gold sitting in a safety deposit box in my bank. But he says, the word of God is more to be desired than pure gold. It's sweeter than honey from the comb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Great reward in keeping God's words. James 1.18 in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth 
so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. He brought us forth, you, all of you, me, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Now, I'm, I'm kind of piling scripture upon scripture because I just want to let scripture speak. And probably we could pile scripture upon scripture about this for an hour just by itself. That the word of God's own testimony about itself. As you all know, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Like I said, many more could be added. But those are the, the scriptures that give us the vision. I, I was reading in preparation for this a story that I wanted to pass along to you about the power of God's word. Now I just lost my page. This is a story about a Japanese man. His name was Tokichi Ichi. He was hanged for murder in Tokyo in 1918. He had been sent to prison more than 20 times. You would think they just would, wouldn't let him out anymore. But, uh, and he was known for being as cruel as a tiger. On one occasion, after attacking a prison official, he was gagged and bound, and his body was suspended in such a way that his toes barely reached the ground. But he stubbornly refused to say he was sorry for what he had done. Just before being sentenced to death, Takichi was sent a New Testament by two Christian missionaries, Miss West and Miss McDonald. After a visit from Miss West, he began to read the story of Jesus' trial and execution. His attention was riveted by the sentence, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This sentence, just a sentence, transformed his life. He said, I stopped. I was stabbed to the heart as if by a five-inch nail. What did the verse reveal to me? Shall I call it the love of the heart of Christ? Shall I call it his compassion? I do not know what to call it. I only know that with an unspeakably grateful heart, I believed. Tokichi was sentenced to death and accepted it as, quote, the fair, impartial judgment of God. Now the word that had brought him to faith also sustained his faith in an amazing way. Near the end, Miss West directed him to the words of 2 Corinthians 6, verses 8 through 10, concerning the suffering of the righteous. The words moved him very deeply, and he wrote, as sorrowing, yet always rejoicing. People will say that I must have a very sorrowful heart because I am daily awaiting the execution of my death sentence. This is not the case. I feel neither sorrow nor distress nor any pain. Locked up in a prison cell six feet by nine in size, I am infinitely happier than I was in the days of my sinning when I did not know God. Day and night, I am talking with Jesus Christ. As poor, yet making many rich, this certainly does not apply to the evil life I led before I repented. But perhaps in the future, someone in the world may hear that the most desperate villain that ever lived repented of his sins and was saved by the power of Christ, and so may come to repent also. Then it may be that though I am poor myself, I shall be able to make many rich. The word sustained him to the end, and on the scaffold, with great humility and earnestness, he uttered his last words, My soul, purified today, returns to the city of God. And we could multiply stories about the power of the word of God in people's lives. I mean, we're, we're here because of the power of the word of God and how it changes our hearts and makes us new creatures. So we have the vision. Vision, intention, means. And then we want to think about the intention. I think this is, this is really maybe the difficult part for us to hear. We, we know what God's word is. How do we intend to respond to it? I think most of us would say, well, I know how I should respond to it. George Mueller, the 19th century man, uh, you may know, he ran orphanages in England, and he never asked for money. 
Um, I, I recommend his biography, by, by the way, if you've never read about George Mueller, he ran these orphanages. I mean, he was a hellion, became a Christian, and decided that he should run these orphanages, but never wanted to ask for money. He said, God will provide for everything we need. He had many times, I know one occasion where he had the orphans sitting at the table with no food. They did not know where the meal was going to come from, and they were trusting that it would show up, and it did. And he has many stories that are just, they're crazy, really, uh, about how God uh, came through. But I want to read this quote about what he says about the Word of God and his intention to, to meditate on it. He said, I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. Let me just stop right there. Is that our first and great primary business every day, to have our souls happy in the Lord? when we get up in the morning. He said, I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the word of God and to meditation on it. What is the food of the inner man? Not prayer, but the word of God. And not the simple reading of the word of God so that it only passes through our minds just as water runs through a pipe. But considering what we read, pondering over it, and applying to our hearts. Jonathan Edwards, the 18th century pastor and theologian, exhorted the people to, quote, be assiduous. That means constant, unremitting, diligent. Be assiduous in reading the Holy Scriptures. This is the fountain whence all knowledge of divinity must be derived. Therefore, let not this treasure lie by you neglected. Let not this treasure lie by you neglected. And yet, that is too often what we do. It's too often what I do. Um, I mean, I've, I've been to seminary. I was a Bible teacher. I remember being a Bible teacher for 10 years, and a lot of people thought, oh, being a Bible teacher, it's great. You know, you, you teach the Bible. You're in the Bible all the time. You read the Bible. Yeah, I go, but you can be in the Bible, and then as it's kind of like a textbook, and then you set it aside and think, well, I was in the Bible. That's good, right? But we, I, I would very often let it just lie by me neglected. There it is there. I I read it a little bit. We tell ourselves, we tell others that the Bible is very central to our lives. Uh, We often say, I know I say, I've heard in many of my small groups too, you know, it's a struggle to read the scripture. I have a lot of things. I'm busy. I've got this and that to do. And I'm sure that's true. We are all very busy. But the reality is that I think we don't make time, the time we, we think we ought to make, or that the Bible, if what, what I read from the scripture about the word of God is true, and it is, then that means we ought to want to be experts in this word. And we're experts in a lot of things. I mean, I, I'm sure there are a lot of you know, people who are expert in Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know, Fixer Upper. I mean, they are experts. They could tell you everything about Joanna's style and what she wants, you know, how she lays out the, you know, I, there are friends I know that have reached the, you know, bazillionth level of Halo or whatever it is in the video game world, I, you know, I don't know, MLB 20, uh, whatever the games are, we have plenty of things, but we haven't intended to become experts in the Word of God, we haven't intended to really say, that's the narrative, that's the truth that I want to absolutely and utterly permeate my thinking. And if we, if we feel guilty about this, that's probably good because we are guilty. And we need to repent. I mean, that's, that's the call today. We need to repent of our neglect of the Word of God, of meditation on it, of memorization of it. So my plea this morning is that we would hear what God says We would not harden our hearts. We would set our wills in firm reliance on God's grace to meditate on the scripture, to memorize God's word. Um, As one man said, we don't find time for things. We make time for them. If you, I I enjoy my wife. I enjoy spending time with her. I love her. She's fun to be around. I like hanging out with her. I make time for it. Even if my kids went to bed at 10 o'clock, uh, you know, I mean, I usually go, well, I want to spend time with my wife, so I may not go to bed till 11.30. I make time for it. We make time for what we value. 
and we value TV and social media and video games and sports and recreation and many other things, both serious and trivial. We want to value the word of God and believe what God says about it. Jesus spoke well of our generation when he said, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things. That phrase is just, the desires for other things enter in and they choke the word. They choke it. So what is God's word for us today? Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. To me, that just says, memorize God's word. And I would suggest that when we think about memorizing God's word, now we'll talk about the means. Right now, we're still on vision and intention. I'm trying to say the intention has to be there. To say to yourself, I will intend before God and by his grace to meditate on and to memorize his word. I would get other people involved with you. I'll say more about that. And I would intend to do it for not just individual passages, but whole long passages and chapters. I'll say more about that. Joshua 1.8, God says, And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Proverbs 7, verses 2 and 3. Keep my commandments and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. If a fly comes near your eye, you just let it stay there. If you see something flying at your eye, right, you, you guard it. You protect it. Guard my instructions as you guard the pupil of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Memorize them. John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My words, your words must abide. His words must abide in us. Finally, Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah says, Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. I ate them. Okay, so there's many more, again, about memorizing Scripture. Uh, I do have a quote here. I, know I, like to, I like to quote people for some reason. But Dallas Willard has a great quote, and he says this. You know, Dallas Willard's kind of like the spiritual disciplines guru about practicing silence and solitude and all these other kinds of disciplines. But he says, memorization of Scripture is one way of taking charge of the contents of our conscious thoughts and of the feelings, beliefs, and actions that depend upon them. When we take the scriptures in by memorization, the words of God also affect our lives far beyond our consciousness. I think that's a great point. A lot of people say, well, I'm not good at memorizing. I don't know, I've tried memorizing. It, doesn't do that much. It, it has an effect on us far beyond what our conscious thought is. We have thoughts and attitudes and feelings that we don't think about them. They're just there. We act on those. We live out of those. Our body is ready to respond in certain ways unconsciously. It's been trained that way. But it's not been trained on the Word of God. When it is trained on the Word of God, then it, we respond differently without really being overly conscious about that. And that's where we want to be. It's like an athlete. I've told my son many times, I said, what you want to get to the point is when you step into the batter's box as a baseball player, your swing happens without any thought, kind of like breathing. Right, Eli? You, when you get in there, you just want to be so practiced that it happens without even thinking about it. He says, we come to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God through memorization God's words reside in our body, in our social environment, in the constant orientation of our will, and in the depths of our soul. They become a power, a substance that sustains and directs us without our even thinking of them, and they emerge into conscious thought and action as needed. This is what Jesus spoke of as abiding, dwelling in him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. 
So Dallas said, the first and primary discipline you should be engaged in is memorization of Scripture. Now, I'll talk about that again in terms of the, the actual means of it, but um, I want to share, just by way of illustration, again, my own, um, well, let me say this. People might say, well, I don't need to memorize the Scripture because I, I have a Bible right here. I mean, I can, I can read it. I remember when I was a teacher, they, they wanted to wire up the school and say, this will be great. We'll have, um, students can all have an iPad in the classroom. They, they'll, they'll, we'll wire it up and every, we'll give every student an iPad and this will be great because then they can just, you know, look up what they don't know. Turns out that doesn't really work because they don't know anything. I mean, you can't look up what you don't, if you don't have it there, you don't know it. I mean, it, it, a student, you know, who wants to learn about the War of 1812, what's he supposed to do? I mean, he could Google the War of 1812 and it may start saying stuff and it references other things that he doesn't know. And then all of a sudden you go, it just doesn't work. If you want to know something, if you want to have actual knowledge, you have to memorize it. That's why you memorize your times tables, right? I mean, you could look them up, but we don't do that. Maybe we do, I don't know. I mean, but when I was in school, we didn't look them up. We memorized them. John Piper says, if we don't carry the word in our heart heads, we cannot savor it in our hearts or wield it in the spirit. If you don't have it at the ready, then life just comes on you and you're, you're not ready. It's not there. And just think about all the things for which we need it. When, when the cancer diagnosis comes in, what's going on in our hearts? Is, this, is the word of God there to fight right then? Because we'll need that. Um, you know, when I, I had a, we had some friends, my wife and I had some friends in the Bay Area. I don't remember if she remembers the story, but when they were younger, they'd started a business. And they'd started with this partner. So it was a husband and wife, and they started this business with a partner. And the partner, they didn't know, I mean, they trusted the partner. But it turns out the partner was evil and intended to steal the business from them secretly. And that's what he did. He started to convert over all the paperwork, got their names out of it, got his name on it, got everything signed over to them. Then one day announced to them, locked them out of the building came over, they came there, locks were changed. You don't own any of this business anymore. And they didn't. He had done it in a way that was, that legally stood up, and that was it. What do you do when that happens to you? I mean, that's kind of a curveball, right? I mean, you think life's going along, you got a business part you trust, and then one day he's stolen the business out from under you. Your whole life is upended. I don't think you just open the Bible up right then and go, oh, let me find a verse. I no, you need to have it at the ready. It needs to be what's already in you, ready to, to deal with. You, you have to be able to wield the sword of the Spirit at that point. And there's many lesser things than that, right? When the guy at work says something about you, he undermines you, and you, you want to go punch him in the face, you know, you need the Word of God right there. When you're anxious about money or finances, as we all are at some time, we worry and we say, what's going to happen? I mean, we... We need God's promises at the ready in our hearts. We need that narrative, that truth deep within us. When you, you know, it, I would have said to my son, when you come up to bat and you're nervous and it's two outs and they're counting on you, the base are low. I mean, you need the word of God right there. I mean, and there's, you know, I mean, I just can't tell you how many times a simple verse like, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I have been sustained by that verse countless times. I can't even think of how many times. Just those simple words by Jesus, right? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Cast your burden upon me, and I'll give you rest. Right? How many of you, you've used that? You use those verses, right? And you go, and many more. All right. So, I think another illustration I probably, another illustration I, I thought was a good one is, you know, I don't know how many of you watch the Food Network. My, my wife and I, we like to watch Food Network, British Baking Show, all sorts of cooking shows. But the one thing I always find interesting is that when you watch these chefs who are really good, they don't have recipes. It's amazing. You look at it and you go, man, that guy just whipped that thing up out of his, out of his head. How did he do that? I can't do it. He didn't just get up that day and go, I think this thing needs about two eggs. And I think maybe a cup of flour would be good. You know, I mean, no, they know 
How do they know? They memorized it. They learned it. My wife has a book called Ratios. It's a great book. It's a book that says, it's about cooking. It says, if you memorize these ratios of ingredients, you can make anything. Just memorize them. You, you don't need a recipe ever again. You can just make anything because you know the ratios that should work. And I, I'm sure those chefs do know those ratios. I think about it, I don't cook that much, but what I do know is I, I played saxophone growing up, clarinet, piano, is a, you know, I should have memorized a lot more. In fact, I wish I had. I don't really play them. I play the saxophone, but piano, I took seven years, I don't play. That, that's another story, but to my shame, I don't play. But I would have had, I, I probably would if I had memorized scales. You know, this is why I think of Tom, you know, Morgan, Tom plays uh, jazz, so Tom will appreciate this. I, I, I don't play jazz, you know, I goof around on my saxophone, but I've been to many jazz concerts. I see those guys improvising up there. They switch keys like that. They're in one key, then they're in another key. There's no sheet music. They're just playing. Guy hears the drummer change beat, they change. The guy changes the key, they go. They're going up and down the register on the side. How are they doing all this? They memorized it. They know that if you're in the key of G or E flat major or E flat minor or whatever, that means you got three flats or two sharps or whatever it is, and they could just go up and down and play whatever they want. They improvise. They know it. If they, they can't say, well, I don't need to know it. I mean, I could just get out the sheet music. Well, then you're not going to be playing improvisational jazz, right? I mean, you're just not going to be able to do it. It, it. The word of God is more important than any of that stuff cooking, music, okay? But we don't memorize it like it is or meditate on it like it is. I'd say one final word about this, that truth is under assault. I'm sure we're all aware of this. Uh, now to give you an example, I mean, male and female, he created them as like a radical truth now. You, you, we better have it at the ready. We need it at the ready against Satan's lies. This is what God says, and it's right and beautiful and true. We don't want to be left defenseless against the assaults. It's not just personal stuff. It's, it's our lives. It's our very lives. Okay, so vision, intention, means. I, I, gotta, I know I need to wrap up here. Um, how do we go about this? Now, there's no perfect way, and there's some experimentation, but I hope that I've at least stood you up to say, yes, the word of God, I know I thought it's important. Now, I, I do think it's important. I want to intend by the setting of my will under God's grace to actually meditate on it, become, become expert in it, memorize it. Uh, small passages, large passages. How do we go about this? Well, I, I can tell you some things I've done. I can tell you some things I know other people do. Um, I, I kind of prefer note cards. I remember, memorize everything I've needed to memorize, usually on note cards. I think they're good because you can take them with you. They're portable. I write down, uh, you know, verse on note cards. And I like to take walks. So uh, in the past, even more when I was single, I would just put note cards, and I'd just have them with me, and I'd just, you know. I live a mile from my work. When our car broke down one time, I, I was walking to work, and I would just take, you know, verses with me and just look at them all, uh, on the way to work and back. It was, it's great. Uh, I, I, that's what I enjoy. Now, some people, I, I confess, I've had them in my car. Uh, you know, you get stopped at a red light. You can pick it up and look at it and go, okay, put it down and just try to say it to yourself. I mean, there's lots of ways you can take time to memorize it if you're, if you're so inclined. If you memorize well by just listening to the word, you can get, you know, check out from the library the Bible on, you know, in the disc or whatever. You can put it, in, you know, you can have it in your car and you can listen to it. Whatever you, whatever helps you to memorize it, uh, a lot of people like to do it just in their study. I, I find also that in terms of means, one thing that helps me to memorize is to say, I'm going to take a passage, I'm just going to uh, meditate on it. I'm going to really live in it and work with it and kind of study it and spend some time in it. And then as I'm doing that, it just gets into my memory. I, I just end up memorizing it um, without really even trying. So, and as I said before, I think it's really important you do this with other people. Um, I... At one point when I was younger, I'd memorized the Sermon on the Mount because we were in a small group and there was two other guys that said, yeah, I'll do it with you. So we'll do it with you and we would we'd get together and we'd say the verses to each other. That gives you some accountability to feel like well, I'm not just doing this you know, on my own. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to pick on Tom, but Tom said that one of the things that he used to do is with the Psalms, he would read it and he would, t he would title it. You would have to think about it enough to kind of give it a title. 
And I think you could also do things like you could take the, the scripture and you could take a paragraph of it and try to write it and write a summary of it in your own words. Um, you could say, hey, I'm going to take this passage and I'm going to try to make 25 observations from this passage and just look at it carefully and see what I can write down that's in this. And, and it takes some effort. Like Dallas Willard says, it doesn't happen without effort, but that's not opposed to God's grace. Um, you can experiment with all sorts of stuff, but I think even just the idea of, of stopping, pondering, meditating, like King David said, I meditate on it day and night. Uh, my son said, how do you do that? You're sleeping at night. <laughs> my sons are very, you know, they ask those kind of questions. Uh, I said, well, I don't know how you actually consciously meditate on it. I don't think he means when you're sleeping. I just think it's a way of saying it's in my mind all the time so that I can turn it over in my mind and think about it. All right. I'm, so the vision is there. The intention is something you have to think about and say, yes, I intend to do that. And then the means which I've given you some ideas. Uh, I wish I could give you more. One thing I will do, um, I started to do this, and I, I'll make it, I told Casey I'd make it available by electronically, and I can send it to you. When I was in college, I had a friend, he and a buddy, they, they came up with this thing called the Century Club, and they said, let's write out a hundred of what we think are the, the, the most just awesome verses for encouraging ourselves and lives. We'll just do like the top, well, we th I mean, it's obviously subjective, but let's do the top 100. And, uh, you know, I, I just started to work through these. And they're great. I mean, a lot of them are verses I have memorized today, you know. And so I'll, I'll throw that out there if that's something you want to use and say, I'll work my way through that with somebody else or a group of people. Maybe in your small group, say, let's try to, you know, work our way through these uh, and start to memorize them. Okay. Let me leave you with uh, a couple of final quotes here. One is by George Mueller again. He says, the first thing... The child of God has to do morning by morning is to obtain food for his inner man. How different when the soul is refreshed and made happy early in the morning from what is when, without spiritual preparation, the service, the trials, and the temptations of the day come upon one. When you're not at the ready, uh, we respond differently. And then finally, this is from John Bunyan who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, the, the most sold book other than the Bible. He says, God, I'm going to put it in, not in the King's English here. God has strewn all the way from the gate of hell where you were to the gate of heaven where you are going with flowers out of his own garden, meaning the word of God. Behold how the promises, invitations, calls, and encouragements like lilies lie round about you. Take heed that you do not tread them under your foot. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's powerful, living, active, mighty. It sustains us, gives us life and breath and everything else. By it will be, we will be judged. It is the standard for all righteousness and truth and goodness and beauty. Give us the heart, Lord, the intention to be expert in it. Not that we're all going to be academic theologians, but that we would know your word. We'd have it at the ready. There's a lot of it there, Lord. We have no want of supply to, to look at and to memorize and to have in our hearts. Help us to meditate on it day and night. Let it be our thought, our narrative, the track that plays in our mind rather than the lies that come from outside us or even inside us. Show us the ways we can do it, Lord. Help us to get with other people and to think about and to actually put into practice ways of meditating and memorizing on your word so that we might grow by it. Thank you for these, my brothers and sisters, Lord. Encourage us. Let your spirit rule and reign in this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen.